And you're trying to give the young people something that will help them. Yet you don't know exactly what it ought to be. Welcome to the Teach Thought Podcast. My name is Drew Perkins. I'm the director of Teach Thought Professional Development, and we're glad you tuned in. I'd like to remind you of the value of leaving reviews on places like iTunes or wherever you're listening, as well as the value of sharing us with your various networks. It's a real pleasure for me to host most of the Teach Thought Podcast episodes and get to bring you thoughtful and interesting guests. And as our audience grows, so does the quality and the quantity of guests that are available to us. So we do encourage you and would appreciate any of those reviews, shares, and things like that to help us grow our audience. If you have questions, comments, or suggestions, please feel free to reach out to me via email at drew at teachthought.com. If you have stumbled upon us but are not familiar with our work in other areas, just a few notes that we do directly work with schools, leaders, and teachers to help them grow to better prepare learners for what we call the modern world by building upon the ethos of teachthought.com. So I invite you to visit our professional development website, wegrowteachers.com where you'll find information on the variety of workshops, consulting services, and events that we offer to help you grow in areas like project-based learning and inquiry, differentiated instruction, assessment, literacy, growth mindset, leadership, and much more. So I invite you again to contact us today to explore how we can help design and deliver professional learning that provokes profound thinking driven by your beautiful questions. In today's podcast, I spoke with Catherine Burble Singh and Tom Hudock. Catherine is the headmistress and founder of Michaela Community School in London, and I first heard about her when she was on the Rubin Report, Dave Rubin's show, and she was talking about a number of things in, in politics and race and things like that, but also touched on education as she is the founder of that school. And some things that I wanted to push back on and did and sort of, uh, I jokingly said, I harassed her a bit on Twitter and finally she agreed as uh, the other guest, Tom Hudock, who is the uh, founder and director of an inquiry school in uh, Victoria, BC, Canada. And they were having some discussion as well on Twitter. So I was able to schedule them, one from London, one from Canada, and get a good discussion around the differences and the similarities in approaches and the role of inquiry and knowledge and understanding. Really fascinating discussion. Certainly could have had more and would love to have more. I think the similarities are certainly around helping to empower children and students and learners to be better prepared for the modern world. There might be some differences in how we might do that, but I really appreciated both of them joining me, and I hope you enjoy the podcast. All right, I am here today with our very first transnational podcast. Joining from London, we have Catherine Burblesing, who is the headmistress and founder of Michaela Community School in London. And Tom Hudock, who is the director and founder of Arc Academy in Victoria, British Columbia, Canada. And of course, I'm in the Louisville, Kentucky area. And I'm happy to have both of them on as we're going to try to sort of unpack some of the differences and similarities in an effort to help listeners better think about how we might prepare students for the modern world. And there are some differences. And really, this this conversation was something that I initiated and and quite honestly I kind of harassed Catherine on Twitter because I'd seen an episode of the Rubin Report and if folks are not familiar with that they should check out that episode. It's an interesting conversation that she had with uh, Dave Rubin and some of the things that she had said that I thought I'd like to unpack and and maybe take some exception to, but before we get into those kinds of things, and, and, and also Tom was in some of the Twitter sort of discussions back and forth as a result of that, so that's the, uh, the reason for the inclusion of Tom here, but 
Let's start with uh, giving, giving folks a little bit more introduction and anything that, that you all might think is relevant to them. Catherine, I'll give you the opportunity to, to uh, talk about yourself first, and then we'll go to Tom. Right, yeah. Well, um, Michaela is a free school, which is a charter school that uh, opened in 2014. We've been open for four and a bit years. Uh, we now have 600 pupils and uh, five-year groups. And um, free schools only started in Britain in 2010, uh, whereas uh, charter schools have been going from, for a long time in, in the United States. And, um, and I suppose we do things differently. Uh, that's the whole idea of, of free schools, that um, different flowers should bloom, and, and we are certainly different. Uh, we um, are very much teacher-led in terms of our instruction as opposed to uh, student-led. And um, we are, are quite strict on the discipline, and uh, we also teach children kindness and gratitude. It's something that we teach explicitly. So those are the three big things that make us different. And, uh, and, and, and we get teachers from all over the world, including Canada and the United States, uh, coming to see us uh, because, because we do things so differently. Okay. And Tom? Yeah, I guess uh, Arc Academy of Inquiry started just this year, so our brand new school. But uh, we've spent uh, a number of years looking at the inquiry model, and there's a variety of models out there. And we just thought, you know, this is a model that really needs to be brought out into the future. It really looks at helping kids with 21st century skills. And we've kind of just really put it all together. So, you know, the methodology that we're using is based off of uh, one from the Pacific School of Innovation and Inquiry. And Jeff Hopkins was the uh, founder and initiator of that one. And so we've really taken that model. He's been very supportive with all this, and we've kind of made it into yet a second school that he's developed. So, Okay, so one of the things that I wanted to do before we kind of dive in, because I, I get the sense, or at least what I think is a perception, is that the progressive and inquiry model is in stark contrast to, I don't know what, what you would, how you would, name it, uh, the, the sort of approach, Catherine. Traditional. Tra yeah, a little bit more traditional, although I think that that's not doing it service. The more I look at the, the school and the website and, and the work and, and even some of the things that you said. So I, I, I'd like to sort of steal man and just make, make, and you've done a little bit of it, but some of the things that I think you are really in favor of and, and, and are pushing as, as a school model is around equality of opportunity, not necessarily equality of outcomes, the real, a real focus on personal responsibility. Uh, you, you believe in, in many ways that the education system is broken. And probably the, the biggest piece is that that, that knowledge has been in many ways sort of forgotten or left behind by the progressive educators in so far as that it's that it's uh, make your own understanding, make your own meaning, that there's not a teacher directing things that, as you say, uh, one of the things that you said is sort of the teacher needs to sit on the bus and drive. And that is in contrast to a facilitator model where students are sort of directing their own learning and that, 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 that that's, that's not preparing them for the future because you can't really do the critical thinking without the knowledge. So is that a fair assessment or what would you add to that? Yeah, yeah, you've done a very good job. Well, <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's more or less what I think. Um, uh, I, I, we, we, I mean, we can get into more details later, but, sure. but, but yes, you've summed it up quite well. Okay. So, uh, and, and again, I want to involve uh, all three of us here, but so, so one of the things that I, that I found a, a bit frustrating as I was listening and watching the Ruben report and I went back and looked at it again is that I, I guess the, the, the characterization of progressive education and how the, that it seemed like that there is a sort of a false choice here and how I would, I would present progressive education. I would consider myself a progressive educator in in some of the same ways that that knowledge is really important and personal responsibility and equity of opportunity and and I would agree in many ways that the education system is broken or, or certainly not has not been doing a great job of preparing students for the modern world. 
but that it doesn't exclude an uh, inquiry model doesn't necessarily exclude knowledge and, and sort of the, the bottom levels or the basic levels, if you want to call it taxonomy. And I don't like to use the word bottom because it's not it's not a, uh, a progression uh, that way. So that when you use inquiry, that knowledge and understanding and remembering is an integral part of that. Uh, I'm not saying that um, there wouldn't be any uh, knowledge involved in in that model, uh, there's always knowledge involved in everything. It just depends on how much and whether the knowledge, uh, the focus on the knowledge is such that one wants to commit it to memory. Um, I think that's key. So often in uh, classrooms, um, children can be learning, but they are thinking about the wrong things and that the teacher may not be clear about what they want them to remember at the end of the lesson, what they want them to have learned. So something that for us at Michaela is that if it hasn't been committed to memory, it hasn't been learned. Um, and that as, as a focus for the teacher uh, means that they're making sure in the classroom that the child is thinking about the thing they want them to learn. Uh, the problem with projects is that they might be doing such a wide variety of different activities that, um, you know, for instance, you're making a PowerPoint uh, about the Spanish Civil War, um, and that might be really interesting, but you might spend most of your time trying to figure out how to make the colors whiz around the screen, um, and you might learn that, but in the end, how much have you actually remembered about the Spanish Civil War? Um, so that is just an example of why it's important for the teacher to be clear, one, that the focus should be remembering certain things and what those certain things are, and that the activities need to be centered around the knowledge that the teacher uh, has, has, has a, a center as, as their focus uh, for what the child needs to remember. Tom, you have anything you'd like to add to that? Yeah, I think uh, I think knowledge is important, and uh, the role of a teacher, whether it's inquiry or any other model, is also uh, very important. So, yeah, Michaela, I agree with you. I think uh, you know the difference where we come from is we look at students being more uh, emergent in their learning as opposed to really self-directed, self-directed, but more emergent as opposed to prescribed. So, yeah, we come from a, you know how do we help a child emerge to creating their own knowledge. And yeah, like the Spanish Civil War is a great example. So how do we create the intensity around that subject area? How does a teacher do that uh, for them to, for the student to really be excited about the topic? And then, you know, we really believe that the intensity of a subject the student's interested in will really help commit to memory that knowledge that they're learning, the new stuff that they're learning. So um, yeah, very similar, I think. So what I want to know is um, when you say create their own knowledge, uh, what do you mean by that exactly? Yeah, so, you know, I guess, you know, you could look at, so let's do the Spanish Civil War. Let's play on that one. So if someone brought that up, a student brings up, say, what is the Spanish Civil War? They could easily look that up in a book. They could go on Google and read about it and watch some videos and then, They've understood some basic surface level information about the Spanish Civil War. They haven't created anything new for themselves. They've just repeated what someone else has already done. So if we want, okay. yeah, if we want so to push them down that path, then the teachers would say, okay, so start asking some questions around that and help them start creating knowledge that they can't just find by just doing an easy research question in Google. Okay, so. And you see, where I would be concerned is that um, pupils' interests uh, vary depending on their backgrounds. And uh, if pupils, if we, if we just say, oh, you know, they're all going to be able to figure it out, uh, the problem is that children as adults use whatever background knowledge they have to direct themselves to learning more. Um, and children who uh, don't have uh, the, the right kind of background, um, so they, they haven't got parents at home with lots of books and they haven't got the dinner table that they sit around in the evening to talk about um, 
the politics of the day through which they might learn about biology and about geography and all sorts. Uh, they have very little to, to work with in the first place. Um, and those children tend to be the ones that suffer most, I'd say, from the more progressive methods of, of teaching. Um, I think that when the teacher has as, as the focus of the lesson to, uh, to review the basics and to ensure that those basics for the child are committed to their long-term memory, um, the child then has something to go to when wanting to discover more. Um, and I suppose what I'd say is we have to think about what the focus is, what is the point of primary and secondary education. See, what you're talking about I think is great when you get later on in life, you know, certainly at university, um, even possibly at A-level, for instance, for us, because we have A-levels, you know, past the age of 16, we have, we have uh, GCSE exams that take place at, at age 16. Um, I think children have enough knowledge in their long-term memories to be able to do the kinds of things you're talking about. Uh, but I think the purpose of primary and secondary education is to embed the basics so that they know them really, really well and so that, and so that they can have equality of opportunity, like Drew said at the beginning, so that, so that school doesn't end up widening the gap. It should close the gap for the least advantaged out there. Yeah, and, and to be clear, the uh, Michaela School, your focus is on disadvantaged students, right? Yeah, so we're in the inner city. I didn't say that at the beginning. We're in the inner city. Um, you know, so there was a child uh, some months ago who was, uh, who was murdered with a knife uh, around the corner from us. Um, there are all sorts of issues with gangs. Uh, there are children who turn up, I say children, 16, 17-year-olds who will turn up on bikes outside carrying knives and wearing masks waiting for our children to come outside. So we are very much in the heart of the inner city. And the children who we teach are certainly deprived. They will either come from families where English is not spoken in the home, or they will come from families where their parents cannot read. Uh, uh, drugs can be an issue. Uh, alcohol can be an issue. You know, the, the, the typical kind of, uh, you know, uh, problems that would exist in the inner city certainly exist for our children. Right. So as you're talking about some of those sort of basic skills and the memorization and pieces there, what strikes me as, as, as a question is the sort of long-term endurance of, and, and utility of those things that they might memorize. And one of the examples that I sometimes use is here in the States, lots of people when they're young in primary school would have had to remember, memorize the 50 states and capitals. And they may have done that with a mnemonic device or a song or, or something like that, fairly prescribed. And then I ask, when I ask adults that, you know, what are, what are the, the 50 states and capitals? I'll, you know, just cite North Dakota or Delaware or something like that. It's very rare that most of the room could recite all of those things. And, and, then I ask them, of course, why, so, so if I'm in Delaware and I say, what's, what's the capital? Well, then, of course, they know it because it's meaningful and it does have relevance and they use that. So one of the things that, that, I, that I feel like is missing in the equation, the way that you characterize per progressive education or have, and, and I don't deny that there's, there's, there are certainly teachers doing this to the extent that they're, they're doing sort of what I call free-range chicken, which is not what we're after at all. But that what's free range chicken? Free range chicken, just you know, letting the, the the students basically wander about. You know, here's your project. I'll see you in two or three weeks. You you we'll see how you do, and and I'll give you a test, or you know, even even worse, I'll just have you present your project. And that there's not a real architecture of design of learning in a way that helps pull that learning from them. Those those desired things, that knowledge, that understanding, remembering, um, and and just the joke, you know that free range chicken is just chickens wandering about and you know there there's right. no okay. yeah, right right uh, so you know when we talk about uncovering those things and using that knowledge in a way that is meaningful so i would agree that saying okay let's make a powerpoint that that there's a real danger in focusing on the wrong things and then but then the job of a teacher in an inquiry uh, sort of project based learning setting 
in my mind is that they are directing it that there is that that the teacher is still facilitating and in charge not facilitating and just sort of letting things happen and hoping for the best kind of thing so when we talk about critical thinking of doing things like analysis and evaluation and and application so we're asking them to create something and so start at the top of bloom's taxonomy create a proposal uh, design investigate you know whatever that verb is and then let's identify those things that we as teachers know they need to know and learn which is that knowledge and understand and remember and then have them do those sort of middle parts of bloom's taxonomy in a way that increases the depth of understanding but also does it in other ways that have other connections so does that make sense okay yeah except that what i would say is that in order for the knowledge to be flexible you need to know it really well Mm -hmm. so it needs to be committed to your long-term memory the problem with your short-term or working memory is that it can only hold six or seven things at the same time Mm -hmm. uh you need to know it so inside out that you don't have to think about it anymore it's just knowledge that you take for granted and all experts and we are experts take our knowledge for granted simply because we've known it for so long um and Oh, you know, you know when you see, I, I saw on YouTube the other day, uh, some people being sued, it was an American thing, and people were being stopped in the street and being asked to name a country, and they couldn't name a country on the map. Now, what um, the, uh, the, pe- the, the people who were doing the filming had done is that they kind of swapped the map around, so instead of having uh, the Americas on the left-hand side, they had the Americas on the right-hand side, and Asia and that was on the left-hand side instead. So it, was, it, had, it had been swapped over, and that little trick really threw them and so there was one man who was pointing to the middle of the map and was 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 actually pointing at at, at alaska and um was saying oh no this this is greenland and you know and it was all kind of funny because he didn't realize that this wasn't greenland but it was because in his head he was thinking but greenland is in the middle of the map i know that so this has to be greenland mm-hmm. now that's because his knowledge isn't flexible enough to be able to have something swapped or look slightly different and for him to then think, oh no, well actually that's moved there and I know, I know this well enough to, to not be tricked by that. I mean, when you speak about the um, people memorizing the, the states and so on, obviously, yes, of course some of that knowledge will go, but you, you are underestimating how important much the basics are in that. So they haven't forgotten, for instance, that California is on the left-hand side. You know? They haven't forgotten that Texas is down below. You know, there are, there are bits, loads of information that they will have learned from that that they still keep within them, and that when they move around the United States or when they're sitting at a party and talking about the United States or they hear the president mention a particular state, they have some sense of what, what, of what their president is talking about. Had they never committed that knowledge to long-term memory, they would go through life lost. And too often, certainly in the inner city, I mean, I've only had the experience of teaching in the inner city, but too often, um, knowledge that we take for granted, like, I don't know, Paris is the capital of France, for instance. Where is Paris? Um, many times in my career I've met children who have no idea Um, and that isn't because it's never been referred to Uh, it will have been referred to in school just like those people who are stopped on the street and asked to name a country they um, they they will have been taught this in school but the methods that were used to teach them did not have as their focus to commit it to memory um, and what they thought about in the lesson, there was, so, there was such variety of what they thought about. So I'm not saying that it's a chicken running around. I, I get it that there is some direction and there is, I, I'm not, you know, I, I'm by no means saying it's a chicken. Uh, but, but if it isn't super tight, if the learning isn't directed in a, in a tight way by the teacher where the focus is we need you to learn X, Y, Z. And then next lesson, and the lesson after that, I'm going to revisit that learning, and I'm going to make sure that the homework I give you revisits that learning. The, the child simply won't remember it. And even though they've learned it at school, so you will hear in the staff room, in staff rooms across the world, teachers say, you'll never believe he wrote this down. I can't believe it. I've taught it to him so many times. I've told this class a hundred times to do this. And look at what they write down. And then we say, well, it's because they're poor. It's because they're black. It's because they live on a, on a council estate. It's a, we give a variety of reasons to explain why the child doesn't know these things. 
when when some of that is true, you know, it's true that they're not surrounded by books at home and they don't have the kinds of parents who can talk to them about politics around the dinner table. So there is some truth to that. But the main reason is because at school, the teaching methods that are being used are not focused enough and don't have revisiting as their focus. So the idea that you practice and that you have to have a deliberate practice which means you isolate the skill that you want. We all want the same things. We all want them to be skilled. So it's not that we think that they don't want, you know, we definitely want them to have skills. It's just that we think that the way to achieve those skills is by isolating the skill and practicing it over and over again. Tom? Well, this is a great conversation. So I, I want to back it up to like the equity of knowledge that you brought up. And I think that is so important because regardless of person's upbringing, regardless of their economic situation, yeah, they should have access to all that knowledge, whether it's, if they're not getting it through their parents, then yeah, they need to get through school. Um, and, you know, and from our, from our standpoint, we look at doing seminars for all the basic type of uh, knowledge and, and subjects such, such as math and uh, languages and French here in Canada is, a, is an important one. So, you know, we do have teachers that lead seminars that talk about some of the basics that need building blocks to build things up. However, I think from, from our perspective, it's, it's how do we teach kids to learn uh, how to learn? And if we can teach them how to learn for themselves and every kid's gonna be a little bit different, you know, you know, some of them might have a little bit of dyslexia if they're on that spectrum and some might be on the gifted side and some just might be what we classify as normal. And yeah, everybody's gonna learn in their own way. And so we feel like if we can really teach them how to learn for themselves, then they're going to be set up for the future and they'll be able to take any direction that they need to take. So Catherine, is there a, a set of, of skills that, or, or is it really more knowledge that you would say that, that students need to be prepared for, you know, what's coming at them in the, in the coming years? No, so as I say, we all want the same things. We want them to be thinking critically. We want them to think independently. But you cannot be inquisitive about something you know little about. You cannot think critically about something unless you know lots about it. So all of the experts out there uh, will do drill on the basics. Um, The great pianists, they will practice their scales over and over again. The professional footballers, will do drills around pylons. Every time you, you see footballers train, the, the big guys, you know, I'm talking Manchester United and, you know, Arsenal, they will, they will kick a ball around the pylons every time they train. Um, you top writers will look at their sentence work and break it down to the subject and verb um, and practice that over and over again. So even when they are experts, they will come back down to the basics and make sure that they practice them over and over again. Even more so is the case at primary and at secondary education level, that we are drilling them in the basics so that it becomes so natural to them that they then take that knowledge for granted and those skills for granted. Um, They become great. You can write beautiful narrative when, and with nuance and using rich language when you have learned phonics so that you can read. So first you learn the alphabet, you drill that, then you learn your phonics, then you learn your words, then you build up to sentence level and then to paragraph level and eventually you end up reading chapter books and so on and you move forward. And then eventually you get to the point where you yourself can write beautiful narrative. But what's important is that we as teachers are able, are able to uncover what those building blocks are. We, we need to decompose the skill. So we all want the skills, but to get to the skill, to get to the final skill, you have to decompose it. So when footballers practice going around those pylons, they're practicing particular type of footwork that they need in order to play a match. Footballers don't just go out there and play a whole match together every time they train. They don't do that. Just like pianists don't just play the beautiful, you know, concerto and that's it. They, they, they bring it down to the basics. And that's because it's through building up those small building blocks, right, um, that you, you end up making it so that when I say commit to long-term memory, it becomes natural. Um, and then it just looks 
easy. It looks beautiful. And when somebody is creative, so they play this amazing piece of music or they draw an extraordinary piece of art, and we say, wow, what beautiful creativity. That creativity has come from, from mastering the basics when they were younger and practicing them throughout their lives. So one thing that, that you said that I'd, I'd like to push back a little bit is on is that you can't be inquisitive about something you know very little about but mm -hmm. i i find that a, a, a bit odd because uh, like for example i look out into the, into the stars at night and think about i mean i have tons of questions millions of questions about the universe and the stars and the galaxies and and all of that so the, I, I know very little about those things and i certainly understand you know how, uh, you, you've got to contextualize you got to have some context to ask questions and having taught for 15 years and you know, the most recent with uh, freshmen so ninth grade uh, 14 14 year old something like that trying to teach economics, for example, they, they have very little context and, and understanding of economics because they haven't had a job, they haven't been in the workforce, so trying to get them to understand supply and demand and ask questions about supply and demand is very difficult because they just don't have much to pull from. So I think that's, that's a, a real art of a teacher in, in actually in, in many ways a science of designing so that you are helping to create some context and I think it, it does make sense to me that as uh, for example I'm a musician I certainly couldn't play a song before I could play a song so I had to practice I had to do some of those sort of drills and and do some of those things before I could play a song and then as I played a song I got better and better but there was still there, there's it doesn't strike me as being sort of either or it's that you could do the drill and do the practice of math or numer uh, literacy or numeracy or those things but also work on some of those skills that we know or we we would predict that they would they would need in the future well and I, I would agree with you I, I don't have a problem with that I mean um, it's not like our children are never writing. I mean, of course they're writing. Um, they're, they, they, they have conversations about their learning and so on. I mean, I, I don't disagree with what you're saying there. They, um, that's part of the practice. Uh, but they have to... It, the point is that you're isolating the skills. You have to isolate the skill. That's the thing. You isolate it, and then you practice that, and then you isolate another skill, and you practice that, and then eventually... You can bring them all together, which is why I say the kind of, uh, the kind of methods that you're talking about later on uh, in one's school career uh, make perfect sense. Um, but earlier on in one's school career, one needs to spend that time mastering the basics. Um, otherwise, children never really understand what they're learning. And I think too often we confuse familiarity with understanding. So they're a little bit familiar with it, but they don't really get it. They don't really know it inside out. So say like your times tables. How do you learn your times tables? And these are really, you know, why do we want to learn our times tables? Because when you go shopping and you want to buy three apples and you know how much one apple costs, you need to be able to, to you know, you need, you need your times tables. You use them all the time in life. Mm -hmm. um, but if you don't sit down and learn them, um, you just won't know them. And of course, once you've learned them, you can then use those times tables to manipulate the most interesting word problems and, and, and be very creative with them. But you do need to, in the first instance, have isolated the particular skill of, of, of times tables and have drilled that until you know it really well. Tom? Yeah, you know, I, when I went to university, I was asked to play on the uh, varsity uh, volleyball team. And it was a lot of fun, you know, and the coaches really, you know, showed us a lot more than what we had in high school. And I thought, you know, the coach really helped us go deep with our skills. They pushed us. They made us try different things. They showed us things we never even knew about. And that was all well and good. However, I chose to be at volleyball. And so we look at kids like there is so much out in the world. We don't know which ones are going to be the writers, which ones are going to be the sports people, which ones are going to be into math and, and all these things. So we really try and leave the door open for the different areas where they want to actually go with their learning and their education. And so, yeah, we talk about early on in the school, school career, you know, do they need basics? Should we focus on them being much more curious and going down which path? And for us, it's a bit of a blend. You know, there are some basics, you know, like Michaela brought up math. Absolutely. So important. 
language. But there are some things that I think that are being taught in school that aren't as important, that I think it's being replaced with this rote uh, memorization, the prescribed learning. It's not really allowing a kid to explore their own interests. And, you know, there's something about that because we've had, you know, as an example, we had a student doing uh, their own inquiry. It was something around um, uh, writing their own book and, and, and whatnot. And they came across a video and they came to the teacher and said, God, that English, the English this person is speaking is really weird. Like, what is it? And the teacher looks at them and says, well, that's Shakespeare. And explains a little bit about what Shakespeare is and who they were. And they're like, that's really interesting. I want to know more about that. And so the teacher immediately starts up a seminar and says, invites the, you know, a bunch of kids and says, if you guys want to know about Shakespeare, I'm going to put on a seminar for the next few weeks. And it's going to be all about Shakespeare. And so a whole bunch of kids just showed up because it was something that they hadn't heard of before. Now they're learning about it. And a couple of the kids actually took that and used that to look at producing their play that they wanted to do. So, uh, you know, there's something about curiosity as well that sometimes I think when we say the basics of learning sometimes takes over more than where, and it doesn't leave enough space for students' curiosity. Yeah, you see, I would say that the more you know about something, um, the more curious you get. And so when you have children who uh, are not getting much knowledge from the home, um, it's really important that we give them that knowledge so that they can then be more curious about it. Uh, They... One of the things, I mean, we get visitors from all over the world, as I say, um, every day, um, mainly teachers, and the teachers are amazed at just how curious our kids are and how uh, how much inquiry is going on, uh, funnily enough, you know, so they, they're so engaged in lessons, their hands are always up, they're all desperate to answer questions and talk about it, and they, you know, you'll see them out at lunchtime, I've never seen so many kids in my life talking about what they're learning in lessons and, and excited about their learning, uh, wanting to learn more. And um, I would say that that's because um, they uh, know lots. I mean, the thing about self-esteem is that uh, success is a precondition for it, I would say. And that self-esteem doesn't come through lessons in self-esteem, but comes through a child succeeding at something. And the more they've been taught the more they're going to succeed at it. Um, And that's real achievement. And so when children see that real achievement, uh, they love it more and more. So, you know, one of the big things about our school, people say, you know, you're so super strict because we are very strict. How is it that you've got got such great buy-in from the kids? Because we do. We have great buy-in. You know, there's there's always the kind of 10% on the outskirts who you keep in line with the tensions. But, you know, the majority of kids are really into it. You know, why are they so into the idea of, 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 of getting the tensions and things? And that's because our kids know that they learn so much with us and so if you ask them you can ask any of them they'll all say to you yeah it is a bit of a pain that we get the tensions but you know it's worth it because I'm learning so much here and I've learned more in, 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 a, in a couple of months here than I've learned than I learned the whole time at primary school and so they're 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 willing to put up with a with a strict environment because they know what it means for the, for the level of learning that they get, and they're so thrilled with feeling clever, with feeling successful. And that is so important when it comes to kids from the inner city who are normally just trotted on by life, um, who, to give them a chance to get to the best universities, you know, we talk about going to Oxford and Cambridge, you know, but in America you'd be talking about, you know, the Ivy League or where, you know, like, the fact is, normally those doors would be closed to these kids. Um, you know, the, the, the worry I have when people say, well, you, you, you need to let them lead with their own interests, is that what we, we underestimate how much a parent, one's parental background influences what interests we have. And so if you come from a background where you're taken to museums and you're taken to art galleries and, and, and your parents talk a bit about Shakespeare every now and again because they use Shakespearean language because we all use it. 
We all do. The, the, the families of my, my children do not use Shakespearean language, but, but, but my friends would. And so they might talk about, you know, uh, roses smelling of sweet and so on, and, 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 and their child might say, oh, what's that? Oh, you know, it's Shakespeare, and that sparks a bit of an interest. And then they hear something on YouTube, and they go, oh, isn't that wonderful? Let me ask my teacher about it. Because there'll be a variety of things that spark interest in that child. But our children don't have that coming from the home. So we have to give it to them in the form of knowledge. Um, And once they've got that, and once they understand it, and Shakespeare is no longer scary, but something of, 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 uh, of interest, because because they can read it and access it because the skill has been isolated and it has been practiced over and over, they then have the confidence to be able to pick up a new Shakespeare play or decide to go and watch, uh, uh, to go to the theater. I mean, the idea of going to the theater for our kids is so, it's so alien. <laughs> like, it's so alien. It, we have to bridge that gap for them. And the only way you can bridge that gap is through knowledge. So when you talk about the, the isolated skill practice, one of the things that I think in good inquiry and, and, and or project-based learning is that you would have that, at least to some extent, per, but perhaps not to the extent that you're talking about. And, and I'm wondering if there's an opportunity cost that you're, you're thinking to building some and, and, and working through some of the other pieces of a project that you would lose the opportunity for additional skill building and skill practice and things like that and 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 also as you talked about sort of the the sort of the the, the dichotomy between being committed to something and being compliant uh, the, the way that you phrased it at first was more about compliance and that strictness and that kind of thing but that they're that they're committed because they're seeing the value of it and the intrinsic value as they as they kind of engage in that process um is is that a fair characterization yeah so i mean look it is they we're super strict in that you know if you were to turn around a couple of times in a lesson you might get a detention for instance and that might be annoying sometimes for a child but they just think well who cares because look how much i'm learning and look how amazing it is and how clever i feel and I'm quite happy to put up with that in order to get what I'm going to get out of this, which is amazing learning. It means that I'm not going to be disruptive by other just more disruptive characters in my class. And it means, it means, I mean, they don't, they don't necessarily realize about the teaching methods and what's happening, but all they know is that they now know lots and that they are curious about things they've never been curious about before because they now understand it. Like they have, they have something to be curious about. If, if you don't know anything, and, and I think this is where sometimes people just underestimate how little children can know, um, especially if they come from families who are not able to give them that knowledge. Uh, when I say, you know, where's Paris? I'm talking about 16-year-olds leaving school. They don't know what the Holocaust is. They don't know where Paris is. They don't know uh, who Winston Churchill is. You know, in, in Britain, that's a big deal, not knowing who Winston Churchill is. You know, <laughs> these are kind of basics. That, that, and this is all my life in various schools that I've been at and seen that where the knowledge of some children is so weak because, because it hasn't been practiced. And it, it hasn't been revisited time and time again where memory is, is focused. I think, sadly, people have, uh, people who are against this idea of, of learning stuff by heart, it's because, and I heard Tom say it, he said, you know, rote learning, this idea that they, or you talked about it when you, when you said about, um, about the states, you know, learning the 50 states. Because you have this idea of long lists of information and people just memorizing these long lists of information. But that's not what happens. You know, that doesn't, isn't what has to happen. It, it's possible maybe 100 years ago that's what people were doing. I don't know. All, what I know that we do at Michaela, maybe you're quite right, uh, Drew, to point out that you know, traditional is the wrong way to describe it. Because when people think traditional, they think long lists of information that people are just memorizing so that they can regurgitate as parrots. That, 
that is certainly not what we're doing. Um, we don't want them to regurgitate. We want them to understand. So you, you, earlier I, I referred to the distinction between familiarity and understanding. We want very much for them to understand what they're learning and to know it properly. Um, but we also want them to have committed it to memory. Uh, if you just learn long lists of stuff, that's just, well, you know, you might do, so you might have some dates that you might want to remember or... Um, yeah, there, there, there are a few things in life out there that would be a few like that. But, well, exactly, multiplication tables. But there are few and far between. I mean, I, you know, we're not sat there in lessons just going, you know, repeat, repeat, repeat. Let's just learn this by and learn it by rote. That's not what we're doing. Um, children are doing paired conversations. They're, they're having class discussions. They're writing things down and analyzing and, and doing all those sorts of things. So you say we're losing out on skills. I'm thinking, well, what skills are you talking about that we're not using? We're using all those skills. The, the big difference is that we are isolating skills and we're using uh, deliberate practice to ensure that those skills become so natural that it's something that you take for granted. Um, it's not that we're all sat there memorizing lists of words, um, although there may be a little bit of that, like with dates or multiplication tables, like we said. Mm -hmm. um, but it's like, okay, so... A good, a good example of this is, um, is, is capitals, for instance, capitals and full stops. You know, if you ask any child where, uh, w uh, you know, when do you use a capital, they'll always tell you the beginning of a sentence, right? And they might say proper nouns and so on as well, but they'll, say, they'll, they'll tell you the beginning of a sentence. But there are many thousands of children out there that even though you ask them, when you ask them, when do you use a capital, they will tell you at the beginning of a sentence, and yet when they write their sentences, they will often leave the capitals off. Now, why is that? That's because there is what's called uh, a knowing and doing gap. So the child knows it, but there's a gap between knowing it and doing it. So they know they should put the capital there, but when they write the sentences, oops, they forget they don't put the capital at the front. Now, in order for them to be sure that they always do it, and so that the skill of putting a capital at the beginning uh, and always doing it is just natural and habitual, the only way it becomes a habit is if you do it over and over again. So what that requires is many sentences where they are putting capitals at the front. And not just writing their own sentences. They might have sentences that have been written out for them, some with capitals, some without, and they're being asked, they're being asked to correct those sentences to put capitals in the right places. And then they're given some sentences where they have to figure out, so which ones are the ones that are correct and which ones are not correct? And then they can spot, spot the mistake, oh, that one doesn't have a capital, this one does. And once they've done that drill over and over and over again, it becomes so natural and habitual that they then put the capital at the beginning of the sentence. So that knowing gap, they know it, they know that they need to put the capital at the beginning, but they also do it, and they do it in every circumstance. So I refer back to the, um, to the people on the road who, didn't, who weren't able to, to name a country. Not one country on the map could they name, right? And it wasn't that they'd never been to school. One woman who was being interviewed said, I've even been to college. How is it possible that I'm looking at a map and I'm unable to name a country, even though she'll have learned this? She knows it, but she's not able to do it, i.e. she's not able to point out that country. And that's because there's a gap between knowing and doing. And in order to bridge that gap, you have to practice. You have to drill. And once you've drilled enough, you then can do it. And it then becomes second nature. And you do that by isolating. So the skill of putting the capital at the beginning of the sentence is the, is the thing that you want them to know. And that's the teacher going, yes, this is this lesson. We are going to make sure we know how to. We not just know it, but we're going to do it. And we're going to do putting capitals at the beginning of the sentence. So I'm going to drill everybody in this. And by the time we get to the end of the week, this has become so natural that this is something that they all do without thinking about. That, that is what we're doing. We're, break, we're decomposing the skill. We're getting it down right to the smallest component, and then we're building back up. And that what, all I'm saying is, is that what you do is fine, but when you're just much further along the line, um, so that there's a lot of background knowledge in your long-term memory that you can refer to and draw out when necessary to be able to direct your own learning later on when you are knowledgeable and mature enough to do so. So I, I, I can't help but think that, that 
some of what we're what we might find as differences are actually maybe in some of the way we're talking about it because the way that I, I appreciate what you're saying in the, the the sort of tightly designed and need for uh, skill practice or whatever it is that, that the knowledge and understanding and, and I do think that that is a dis, really important distinction uh, I know one of the things that you talk about is knowledge matters but the way that you described it there and I, I push back on on just using the term knowledge because as you mentioned like the understanding is knowledge is is not as nearly as powerful as understanding and there is a difference there but the that in a good inquiry in a quality inquiry based and uh, project based learning experience a lot of those things that you mentioned there are should be and need to be present so that there's it, but it's connected to some other thing some something where their students are, are working on creating and 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 we kind of get back to that opportunity cost of are we can we work on those skills and also place it in a context that might be a complex problem in which the students might learn to think about uh, a, a, a solving a complex problem because a, a worry that I have around sort of the characterization of, of traditional or low SES socioeconomic status disadvantaged students especially sort of getting them prepared for college if 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 you, as it were and and getting them to understand and and have that basic knowledge that you're talking about that we that there might be an opportunity cost insofar as that we're missing out on giving them that, that there might be a low ceiling in a sense because we're we're missing Missing out on the opportunity to really focus on some of the complex problem solving, and and to me, one of the biggest pe- one of the biggest things that that people will need in the future as artificial intelligence progresses and knowledge is arguably marginalized in some ways, and and feel free to push back on that is the ability to ask really great questions, and I I, I just wonder about that. Well, I, I, you know, I, I, as I said before, I suppose, uh, you, your questions can only be nuanced and interesting when you know lots about the subject. Um, they, your questions are rich once your knowledge is rich of, about the subject. If you don't know very much, I mean, look, you mentioned the stars a moment ago, and I thought, yeah, I'm curious about the stars. I know so little about the stars. There isn't much that I can ask you about the stars that, that is particularly interesting because I know so little about them. But I can ask you all sorts of interesting questions about education. I, I, can, I can ask questions and explore them and analyze them really, really well because I know so much about it. But if you ask me about the stars, I mean, I, honestly, I don't know what to ask you. And it's not to say that I'm not curious. I mean, I am. I, I, I'd love to know more, more about the stars. But... I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not as curious as I am about education, and that's because I know lots about education, and my interests have peaked even more. The more I know about it, the more I get interested, and so the more I can talk to you, and I get excited about it, and I talk about it to you loads here, and we're speaking for nearly an hour, and I'm like, yeah, and tell me, let me tell you about this, let me tell you about that. If we were talking about stars, our conversation would last about two minutes, because I don't know anything about them, right? Um, it, Knowledge is just a necessary prerequisite. And I'm not say, I don't think either of you say that it isn't. I'm just saying that how much, right? How much? And is it being committed to memory? Um, it needs, you need to have lots of it and you need to commit it to memory for it to be of use to you. Because otherwise, um, you go through life in a kind of fog. And I have known too many children <laughs> in my lifetime leaving school who who will go through life in a kind of fog until they sit themselves down and teach themselves these things. And it's really hard to teach yourself these things. Um, I I go back to the what is the purpose of primary and secondary education. Um, It's to give them tons and tons of practice uh, so that uh, they they take those skills for granted. Um, and, and 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 I think we underestimate how knowledge breeds curiosity. You know, we think to ourselves, it must just come from the child. But when you give them lots of knowledge, the knowledge itself is so amazing. Um, the subject, whether it's a teacher who loves science or a teacher who loves Shakespeare, it doesn't matter. It, the, 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 the content that you're giving them is so fascinating that that in itself will spark the interest. Um, 
I don't think you need gimmicks around it. You just need the knowledge for them to get more interested in what they're learning, I think. But, I mean, I don't know. I'm aware that I'm speaking loads, and Tom has not spoken as much as me. So, <laughs> Tom, please do talk. <laughs> oh, no, this is all good. Uh, I agree. Like, knowledge does spawn curiosity or can spawn curiosity. Uh, I think the inquiry movement maybe if i could put it that way is probably looking at it more like a you know how do we breed curiosity uh right from the day one so when a baby is born i mean they're absolutely curious they will learn how to walk on their own they don't actually need an adult to tell them how to walk and we just want to have that curiosity continued and you know i think when you say practice and and drilling the kids on certain uh pieces of information and knowledge and the the capitals of the countries, yeah, that's a, you know, that's one way to gain the intensity uh, for them to, you know, have that information kind of sink in really hard so it lasts for years and years. Uh, and I think for us, we just come from a, like, you know, how when you get curious about something that, you know, as an adult and you really dive into it, the further you get, the further you dive into it, the more energy you have towards it, the more deep you're going to learn about it even if you have no idea about what the subject is. I mean, I'm learning about podcasting. I have no idea what that was, you know, other than just hearing the word a little while ago, but now I'm diving in really deep and I've got this other cohort of like-minded people who really, we bounce off of each other and we really kind of take it down to as deep as we each want to go. And that kind of environment, I think, is the environment that we're trying to replicate in a school environment because we think that the questions that the kids have are super valuable and it allows us to actually uh, see them for who they are and everybody's going to be a different place so yeah we have kids that may come from homes that aren't are more disadvantaged and some kids that have parents that are highly educated and uh, and they get you know different piece from home but uh, yeah you know when they come to school if we can see them for who they are recognize that they have curiosity support them in that that feeling that they get inside, you're talking about self-esteem earlier. I mean, that self-esteem really starts to bolster. We're starting to see, this is just our first, you know, a couple of months. We're already starting to see kids come around, have that feeling of belonging, um, you know, hit that little bouncing point. We're like, you know what? I can actually ask that question and the teachers are going to be okay with that. Uh, we're starting to see that for, from the number of the kids. So, you know, I think what we're, we're both trying to do the same thing. We're both trying to get kids to, you know, come out of secondary school feeling prepared and able to handle the, the challenges of the world. Uh, I think we're just, you know, we're taking two different ways to build that intensity. And uh, yeah, yeah, I think and we're kind of on the same that. picture, I mean, that, you know? No, I do. I love that. I mean, I love the, um, you know, the commitment of people like you, Tom, who, um, you know, they look at their community and they think, I want to I want to have a school and I want to do X, Y, and Z. And, and, you know, you work really hard to do that for them. And um, and that, that that's wonderful. And uh, and it's great that Drew has found the two of us, you know, across the world like this um, to be able to have a conversation about our different ways of going about that. Um, it, it is. I have great respect for you um, and what you do um, because I know how much... How, how much energy and commitment it takes to be able to uh, to, 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 to set up a school and, 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 and get it to run successfully and to, to get all the teachers on board and the kids on board and so on it's, it's, a, it, it's you know it's a great privilege to speak with you because it's um, you know a huge respect and uh, it's, it's wonderful um, and it's great Drew that you've managed to bring us together for this conversation yeah and I've, as we are mindful of time and, and sort of get towards wrapping up here uh you know i i think the the empowerment of kids and preparation for the future is what we're what we're all after and i do think there's some some real similarities one of the things that i'd, I'd like to to kind of touch on before we we depart and go our merry ways around the globe is and tom i'll start with you because i think there is uh, uh, it's sort of like the the politics of the day when when we say progressive or uh, Catherine, I know on your on your Twitter and and, and talked about on Ruben Report, you know, small C conservative and and values and sort of characterizing or and or mischaracterizing to the extent that 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 is happening. What what do you see as or what would you push back on Tom as far as more traditional because that's that's certainly. 
uh, more, uh, perhaps more uh, conservative and 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 more aligned with the the approach that that uh, Michaela School is using. But and then and then Catherine, what when you talk about progressive schools? Because we would say we are uh, Teach Thought is a progressive education organization. But I I'm leery myself of that because I do think that there's progressive quote unquote educators that are doing some of those things that you the way that you characterize it and you know sort of the, I joke about it it's, it's free range chicken but that's not what we're after so Tom what do you, when do you have kids that you have in your school that are sort of if if if, if it makes sense fleeing from a more traditional school and or their parents and and what does that characterization look like in your your mind and then we'll do the same with Catherine. yeah you know we, we did uh parent uh interviews you know at the beginning when we were starting the school uh before we even started the school we we're just kind of building up who wants to be uh part of the school uh curriculum or the school group and we had this one parent and a daughter come in and she you know, was talking about how her daughter wants to do these different things. She wants to write some comic book stuff. She's really good with stories. She likes to do the artwork as well. And we just asked the daughter, we said, like, what do you want to do? Like, what really interests you? And, you know, she talk, She did talk about the comic book stuff. She did share that she wasn't able to uh, do this in school, that the teachers told her they didn't have time for that, and she had to do that after school. And, uh, you know, she recognized that she didn't fit into this box. And, you know, this is a box that many people talk about, parents talk about it, teachers talk about that there's a box in school that some kids fit in, and that's great. And there's many kids that don't. And for a variety of reasons, it's not anything to do with intellect. And I don't think it has anything to do with, you know, your upbringing. Some kids will fit in and some, some kids won't. And when we talk about traditional and progressive, I mean, these are all labels, but... I really look at, you know, there's, we need to have other options available for kids and families that don't fit into, I'm going to say traditional type of schooling. And maybe some people would say that's the public school system. Uh, but yeah, we just need that. We need more options for these, for these kids and some kids who want to take a curiosity approach and they want to go down that path and build their own learning. Great. And, you know, Michaela, I'm sure you see tons of kids that probably don't fit in a traditional system. It's why you built your school. And, you know, you're seeing how your type of methods work really well for the kids that you have. And so for me, it's just more, let's have more opportunity to be open-minded about how we're actually going to approach education for the future. And Catherine, you're one of the th- the quotes that, that you had said on the Ruben report is one of the biggest problems, or I think you said the biggest problem, progressive teaching methods that have infiltrated our schools. And then you kind of said you're drawing something out of the child as opposed to putting something in. So... I'm not seeing as much of a uh, sort of free range chicken, quote unquote, with progressive schools or progressive teaching, but maybe you're seeing more of it. And, and what's that? I mean, is there a percentage? Well, it, was or? The distinction, it was the distinction that I was talking about earlier about uh, having memory as your focus and isolating the skill. Um, you know, there are a lot of paradoxes in education. I mean, you talked about small C uh, conservative values. I mean, that's more about mm-hmm. the ethos at our school. Sure. Um, you know, you don't, you, you could, you could be educationally conservative, um, but not um, have such a small C conservative ethos. We so happen to to have both. You know, we're both educationally conservative, and we are also our ethos is also conservative. And I stress small C because there are lots of big C conservatives out there who aren't particularly small C conservative. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, uh, the paradoxes I would talk about would be, you know, I would say in order to be politically progressive, you need to be educationally conservative. And I would say that you only really um, reach autonomy uh, through authority. And uh, and I would say that you only uh, set children free, free uh, through teaching them self-control. Um, it, 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 I would say that it's why we have great literature. It's why we have, it's why we have uh, great, you know, extraordinary films and beautiful art and so on. It, it's because of these paradoxes in life and these contradictions in life that you can only be f- free through self-control. That seems odd. Oh, it, it's, it's counterintuitive. It's counterintuitive that authority should bring you autonomy. But, but that's why we have great literature, because life is one big paradox. And, 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 and that's what we're all about at Michaela, is what I'd say. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. One of the things you, you had said, the education, the progressive 
progressives think that education makes you less free and and I would certainly as as I consider myself a progressive educator I would I would push back on that as well I I would say that education absolutely should should make you free and and I'm wondering as we wrap up here is there a different because we had we'd mentioned the disadvantage in low what we call low SES low socioeconomic status kids is that different for uh, so if you were teaching let's let me ask it this way if you were teaching a school that were higher uh, more advantaged kids the ones who are talking with their parents would you teach it would you structure your school differently Catherine? um yeah it's an interesting question uh it would depend on how much knowledge they were getting at home it, it would and when i say how much knowledge i mean how much of that knowledge has been committed to memory um it, it, it really does depend on that. Have they practiced it loads? If they've already practiced it loads, then fine, the job's done. I don't know. <laughs> um, it, it, it depends. I, I suspect perhaps not as much as we would like. Uh, there's certainly a big difference between uh, the homes of the families where our children come from and, and other homes elsewhere where the children are, are more privileged. But even those children, I imagine, haven't practiced uh, the knowledge enough. Okay. Well, let me wrap up here by giving you all an opportunity to share links and all that stuff, and we'll put them in the show notes. But Catherine, let's start with you. And I and and also, will you t- please tell me why Miss Snuffy is your is your Twitter handle? <laughs> I know, it's very funny, isn't it? Well, um, so yeah, so my Twitter uh, account is Miss uh, underscore Snuffy, so that's S-N-U-F-F-Y, and the reason it's Miss Snuffy is because uh, years ago I wrote a blog uh, in the days when no one wrote blogs, um, and it was called To Miss Love after the uh, book and film with Sidney Poitier, To Sir With Love. And um, and so I called this thing to Miss with Love, and I used to write a few um, blog posts every week. And um, I was called Miss Snuffleupagus, and the idea was the elephant in the room. You'll all know Snuffleupagus mm-hmm. from uh, Sesame Street. Sure. And so he was this big elephant, and you know, uh, or mammoth, I suppose. And he, a um, uh, big bird, would always talk about him. And he, whenever the friends came along, they never saw him because he was never there. Anyway, the point is. I was in Miss Snuffleupagus, which went, got shortened to Miss Snuffy. And then when I went on Twitter, I just kept that. And, of course, now it's a bit odd because I'm like this headmistress. And then I have to say my Twitter <laughs> handle is Miss Snuffy. <laughs> but that's, yes, that is my Twitter handle. <laughs> well, I was hoping it was Snuffleupagus because it, it, otherwise I would have been disappointed. Um, yeah. <laughs> and the website is mcsbrent.co.uk. Any other, any other things you'd no, like to no. put out there? No, no, that's it. That's it. Okay, Tom? Uh, yeah, I guess our school website is uh, arcacademy, A-R-C, academy.ca, and anybody can get a hold of me on Twitter, it's pretty easy, Tom Hudock, uh, T-O-M-H-U-D-O-C-K, and uh, yeah, if you want to look me up on Medium as well, Medium's a blogging website, I'll be starting to post a lot more there, and soon announcing a web, uh, podcast as well. Okay, well... Okay. Yeah, well, uh, thank you both for taking the time to do this, and, and I know it wasn't easy and getting all our schedules. And I, you know, I, I just I wanted to to have the discussion for a number of reasons, but if nothing else, to sort of further the practice of having some hard discussions that we've got to be able to have. And even though we disagree about some things, being able to figure out what we do agree about and have meaningful discussions as opposed to just yelling at each other, which seems to be the norm <laughs> about anything else, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So thank you all so much. Thank you. Thanks, Drew. It was a really great idea. Thank you for getting us together. That'll do it for today's podcast episode. Thanks again for tuning in. Don't forget to review us and share us on your network so we can grow our audience to better meet your needs. Also, don't forget to find us on our websites, teachthought.com and wegrowteachers.com, as well as our various social media outlets.